Hello, everyone in YouTube or Facebook land, wherever you're watching. Today, I'm going to be doing a photo editing live demonstration using images submitted by subscribers. So if that's something that you would like to participate in, you could submit your images and have me edit them to see how I would approach your image to make it better. Using the form in the description below the video, just fill that out and send me a couple of your images preferably raw, that you would like me to have a crack at for you. Today, we're going to be working actually mostly in Luminar. So if you are new to Luminar or if you're new to photo editing, you'll be able to see the power of Luminar and what it can do. If you've never used it before, if you're a Lightroom or a Photoshop user predominantly, just know that everything that I'm doing in Luminar can be done as a plugin if you buy Luminar. So if you are using Lightroom or Photoshop, you can actually open Luminar as a plugin for those programs. And I'll quickly show that in one or two examples as well. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, let me get that off of there. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. And if you set a notification as a reminder, you'll get a notice of any new videos that we publish and when I'm going live every week at the same time. So right now, which is Wednesday, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, um, I am doing this event. So come join in, participate in the chat. Feel free to ask any questions that you have about anything you're seeing in the chat. My husband, Rob, is there. Uh, you may recognize him. He's our, my webmaster. So if you have any questions about anything, um, he'll also be sharing some links to any articles or references that I talk about during the event. So I see some regulars. We've got Ray and Ron and Holly. Yay, she made it. <laughs> and she said alarm, she says, so she didn't forget to join in. Perfect. That's exactly what we want you to do. So glad you made it. I think I even have some of your images. So take a look at the screen. I believe those are your images we're going to look at. And Marguerite, another regular. Great to have you. <laughs> Another one said an alarm. Awesome. Yes. I'm glad that you're all here. So I'm going to dig right in and start with processing. And as you can see, I am using Luminar right now as the standalone version. Okay. So if you are using Lightroom, I'll just show you really quickly. I've got the same images. Okay. And you can open any of these images into Luminar just simply by, I'm going to use this one as an example, opening the image and then right clicking. And you can do it two different ways. You can actually do it, I need to find it here, as export and then send the source file. So it'll actually send the raw file to Luminar, okay? So if you've not done any editing in, in Lightroom already on this image, it will send the source file to Luminar. So you'll have more data to work on. If you have done some editing in Lightroom, um, for example, I did some editing on this one. I did some basic editing just to adjust a few things, uh, adjusting the uh, tint, color tint and so on. And if I wanna start from there, then you just right click and choose edit in and open in Luminar AI, okay? Another way to do it is to open it as a smart object in Photoshop if you were using Photoshop as your main editor, or if you already have your image open in Photoshop, then just create the layer as a smart object and start your Luminar plugin from there. Then it will become fully editable, meaning that you can go back to Photoshop and anything that you did in Luminar, you can then just evoke Luminar again and start right from where you left off in Luminar. So that's really totally non-destructive editing. So I'm going to just slip over to Luminar here. So I've got a few interesting images to work on. Um, you'll see me facing this way because my laptop is over here and, and my camera is over here. So if you see me doing that, I've got two monitors on the go here. All right, so I've got Holly's images. And since she's here, I might as well start with hers. All right, so recently Luminar introduced their new portrait bokeh AI. Um, Rob, if you could share a link to either the article on the website or direct to the YouTube video where I did a tutorial on the 
the portrait bokeh AI that is now built into Luminar. And it's really fantastic. So I wanted to take a few examples today of people photography because currently it only works on um, analyzing people's faces. You can't do it on, for example, um, a pet or an animal face, okay? So if you wanna throw out um, the background out of focus in your wildlife photos, it doesn't do that yet, but that's something that people have been requesting. And I'm just gonna pop into um, the chat here and I'll put it up on the screen for you. If you are wanting that as a feature, by all means, email Skylum directly, email their support and put it in as a feature request, okay? So that's their email address. So tell them the things that you want the program to do because they're very responsive and they absolutely listen, okay? Okay, so let's take this one of Holly's. I'm not gonna use any templates on this one to start because I wanna show you the tools directly and how this new portrait Boca tool works, okay? So she's already got a background that's fairly blurry because let me see if I can see her shooting information. Yeah, she shot at f2.8, excuse me. So she's already got a nice large aperture and the background is far away. So those are two key elements to getting a blurry background. But if you don't have a lens with a large aperture, let's say you, know, you only have a kit lens and it only goes to 5.6 when you're zoomed in, you may not be able to get this type of creamy bokeh. So let's take a look at how it works. So I'm gonna do some basic editing first. I always recommend starting with the Enhance AI, which is the first tool at the top when you open Luminar AI, and just kind of slide it all the way and see what it does, right? So what I recommend is finding a middle ground. You can see that it's actually lightening the shadows, giving some more contrast, but I don't wanna add contrast in this case. So I'm going to leave that one alone and adjust some of the things manually. Okay. Now I'm down into the light panel. And I've talked about color profiles a lot when we've been working in Lightroom. So I wanna see if I can pull down the profiles here. Yes. Okay, so Holly, if you've got Luminar um, and you've got this image in Luminar, this is where you find the camera profiles. Okay, if you don't see yours here, excuse me. <laughs> if you don't see your camera profiles here, you just need to go and load them. Um, either from a DNG or find the um, profile for your camera, okay? And that may be that may mean going to um, the website for your camera manufacturer. All right, so I'm just going to kind of scroll through these. So um, it's on it's on Luminar default as a starting point. Let's take a look at we've got Adobe Standard landscape okay which you can see is really increased the vibrancy and darkness of her dress and that's because landscape is trying to darken the sky for you okay so you could see that that would work really well portrait portrait usually gives you more um skin tones a little bit more pinks neutral faithful okay so faithful is actually not bad because what i'm looking at is it brings down the contrast okay, so their faces look really orange in the landscape one I'm gonna say either the Adobe Standard or the Faithful. So I'm gonna start with that one, okay? Now, if you're wondering about if there's a histogram inside of Luminar, yes, there is. Again, this is currently something that people are asking for some changes to because it's quite small. Uh, let me get my little cursor demonstrator here. Okay. So see the histogram up here? So it's kind of small and some people are saying, okay, it's not very useful or usable. But you'll notice that when I'm in this light tool here, if you open up the curves section, if you don't see that, just click the little down arrow to open the curves part. You can see the histogram there as well, okay? So if you wanna see a larger histogram, just go to the curves, okay? And if you want to see the clipping areas, just hit J on your keyboard. Um, many of the keyboard shortcuts that are available for uh, Lightroom work in Luminar as well. And if you go to the um, online user guide, there are some keyboard shortcuts available for Luminar as well. Um, you might wanna grab a link to that, Rob, but you probably have to do a bit more work to get it um, inside the back end of, um, of Impact Radius. All right, so. Uh, we could add that later. So this is what's showing the clipping. So clipping means there's no detail. So where you see the red um, areas, 
<coughs> that means those areas are too bright for detail or off the right side of the graph. Where you see blue, we're off the left side of the graph in the black area. I'm not concerned about that, but I am concerned about the highlights. So I want to drag this highlight slider down and see what's happening is I'm getting rid of those clipping areas. So I'm just going to keep going and see all the way. Okay. So see what's happening is it's lowered all of those highlights. Okay. If I do a before and after, it's also made her look a little bit less shiny. Okay. So that's doing a good thing overall. I'm probably going to just put it back a tiny bit. Well, that looks pretty good. So there's just a little bit of a highlight on her tooth. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is um, I'm just looking at real close. So she's just got a highlight on her tooth, so I'm not too concerned about that. All right, so, so far we've adjusted the tone and the color profile. Otherwise, the exposure looks good, okay? By doing that, it's also fixed some of the contrast problems, okay? We could even give it a bit more contrast, but I'm gonna come back to that after we do some adjustments on the background, okay? Next thing I'm gonna do is actually straighten it. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a tickle in my throat. I'm gonna straighten it because you can see it's kind of tilting. So I'm gonna open the Composition AI tool and click this first one under Perspective. Okay, so you can see it's kind of a square with a line through it. And it analyzes your image to try and straighten the verticals and horizontals. And it's done a good job, okay? So I'm gonna actually come in even a little bit tighter to try and get rid of most of this guy over here, his leg, okay? How about like that. So now we've gotten rid of that. We can kind of clone out his foot a bit later. I might add a vignette here, okay? So a vignette is going to darken the edges a little bit. And I'm just going to leave it centered for now. So you can see if you make it really dark and lower the feather, you can see the positioning of the vignette. And then you can decide if you want to make it rounder or change the shape. Or you can even, in Luminar, change the position. So if I want a smaller vignette, now you can see it's cutting into their head. In Lightroom, you can't move it around. So you'd have to use a radio filter. But in Luminar, you can actually move it around. I'm going to make it more round, like so. And then just put the feather back over to something on the plus side and adjust the amount so it's not so obvious. Okay. So I go to extremes to see the placement and where it's going to go. And then I put it back to where I want the finished product to look because you don't want your vignettes to look like that. Okay. You don't want to be able to see the circle. You want it to be soft on the edge, meaning the feathers high and the amount to be a little more gentle so that it's not obvious, right? If you look at the image and the first thing you see is the vignette, it's overdone or it's not been softened enough. Okay. Uh, I do see a question from Holly. Okay, so if it isn't there, uh, then yes, it didn't recognize your camera profile. So I'm not sure why that's the case. Um, I've had a couple other people ask that on um, in some YouTube comments. And the camera, we did look it up, and obviously your camera is supported because my Luminar sees it. I would suggest making sure that your Luminar is 100% up to date. And if you can't find the camera profile, Email um, Skylum support again, and they may be able to troubleshoot why it's not showing up for you. Okay. Again, there is their support email. Okay. Question about Luminar. Does it work like a, a catalog like Capture One and Lightroom? Yes, it is catalog based, Emmanuel. Um, so yes, all the images are inside a catalog. And you can see that up at top here. It even says catalog, right? And right now I'm inside of an album, which is similar to collections in Lightroom. So yes, it's very similar in how it works. Awesome, okay, so let's continue. And I'm gonna go straight down here into the portrait section, okay? I'm gonna zoom in, uh, that's a little bit too much zooming. I'm gonna zoom in. Um, actually, there's something else I might do before I do the portrait section. Now you notice that they're a tiny little bit um, out of focus, okay? They're not as sharp as they could be. And uh, it looks like maybe, yeah, see the sharpness is here. I don't know if you can see that, 
but the hair right here on her arm and the sequins on her dress are sharp, but their eyes are not. So um, I've talked about this before, and this is actually a great little trick. Um, Topaz Sharpen AI is a great product if you have images like this that need sharpening that are, are just a bit out of focus or maybe they have motion blur. But if you already own Luminar, try this first, okay? Go to the details tool and I'm gonna add some sharpening. Let's say I'm gonna put it up to about 25 or 30, somewhere in that range. Then I'm going to crank the small details. Now I'm gonna go quite high um, and I'm not gonna keep it there because you see what it does to their skin, but see how their eyes look a lot sharper, right? So I'm gonna bring the medium details up and the small details up, not quite so high. And I'm literally just gonna paint it in to the spots that I want sharp, right? So the things that you want sharp, and this comes from the days of me being an old school retoucher, okay? So the things that you want sharp are the eyes, okay? So I'm going to open the mask, click this little thing here, and I'm gonna make sure I have the paint brush at 100% opacity. And I'm just gonna turn this off so you can see my actual brush size here. Okay, so I'm gonna get a brush. You can see the circles, okay? So the circles that you're seeing here is the size of the brush, but also the amount of fade, just like on the vignette, okay? So if I make the softness zero, okay? Now I have a hard edge brush. So if I paint, it's a hard line, okay? There's no softness. I want it to be a little bit softer, but I want it to be a little more precise for this than usual. So I'm gonna lower the softness to about 50%. And then make my brush smaller, and I'm just gonna paint over their eyes. Okay, because you don't want the skin to be sharpened, their teeth and lips. Okay, right? in case here is just his lips, so his eyes. And I'm gonna do the hair as well. Okay. Probably his earring and his ear, okay, because that will look anything that you would look at for trying to see is the picture sharp. Okay, so I want to get most of his hair. And I don't have to do a super critical job, okay. If I wanted to do a really critical job, I'd zoom in to 100% and really dial the brush in a little smaller and probably paint a little bit at a time, okay. And let's give her hair a little bit of detail as well. Okay. I'm being careful not to get it on their skin. That's the main thing, okay? Because I don't want to sharpen the skin. Because if their face looks sharp, okay, I'm just going to take it to extreme again so you can see it. Right? So let me just turn this tool off. Okay, so watch their eyes. Okay, see how it's kind of blurry now versus sharper, okay? So it does a really good job. Look at picking up the highlights in his hair. So I'm not gonna bring it up that high. You've got the idea, okay? So you can really um, use this tool and increasing the masking will keep it off of the face and the skin even more, right? If I zoom out, if there's anything else that I want to sharpen, um, let's just put my brush softer and I'm gonna paint at 50% opacity. I wanna make sure that, you know, their clothing looks fairly sharp as well. So I'm just gonna paint a little bit over his clothes and over her dress and that that little bracelet. Okay, so I wanna make sure that the parts that should be sharp or should look sharp do. Okay, so I'm just picking up the jewelry bits, okay? Like so. Okay. All right, so close that tool. And now I just saw something here that I want to fix because he's got a string hanging out of his pocket. I wouldn't have seen that had I not been zoomed in to 100%. So there's pros and cons of zooming in to 100%. Um, you don't want to generally look at your image that way all the time because you'll see things too closely, if that makes sense. Um, you, you're looking at what's called pixel peeping at that point, but allowing me to look for flaws and things, especially when I'm checking sharpness, you do want to come in to um, 100%. So I just use the erase tool really quickly to get rid of that string on his jacket. All right, 
them out. Now let's go down to the portrait tools and the thing that everybody's been waiting for. Uh, before I do that one, I'm going to keep you in suspense a little bit longer. Um, the body AI was a tool that was added a little while ago. Um, if you go to the right on the shape, again, I'm going to go to extreme. It takes a minute for it to catch up because it's analyzing. It's literally going to make them look skinnier, okay? And abdomen, it what it does is it tries to do a crunch. Okay, so see how it's affecting this area of his stomach? And it's kind of like sucking in his, his gut a little bit. So if somebody looks puffy, that can work really well, okay? The next one I'm going to look at is the skin, okay? Because their skin, her skin is good, but she's got a little bit of shine on her face. Um, maybe it's hot or, you know, she was sweaty or something. And the um, lowering the highlights has helped that. But let's see what happens if we drag this shine removal up. And also the amount, okay? So the amount on the Skin AI tool is about softening the skin. Now, this one you want to be careful about because it's going to look good on her, but guys don't necessarily want to have their skin as, sharp, as soft, okay? So I'm probably going to find a balance and leave it somewhere around 30 that looks good for both of them, okay? I'm also going to check off this Skin Defects Removal and see how it does on his skin. Okay, so do you see the difference? Look what it's done to, he's either got some blemishes or some five o'clock shadow, and it's picked up most of them, right? And it's done a nice job on her face. Let's see if I go a little farther with the blur, right? If I take it all the way up with the blur, we get rid of most of it, but now he looks, he looks too plastic, okay? So I'm gonna leave it somewhere in the middle, and you can see that it's picked up most of his blemishes, if I wanted to do a, get rid of the rest of them, I can just go back into Erase and do that as well, okay? Next, I'm gonna do Face AI, and I'm just gonna start at the top, okay? So Face Light is another little trick that I found a hack for, okay? So literally, it's like adding a reflector to the face. Let me zoom out so you can see the whole image. Okay, so see what it's doing is it's literally lighting up the face okay so imagine i put a flash on them okay now the cool thing is if i do that and then go in here and lower the exposure the rest of the image gets darker okay so now in effect it's really brought their faces out okay i think i've gone too far with the the body ai there okay so i'm just gonna scale that back because they don't really need thinning okay i'm just gonna undo that one Keep in mind that the more AI tools you use, uh, the slower the program may run because the more of these tools you are adding, the more AI is running in the background, okay? So I'm running you know, a fairly new computer and it's got lots of memory and power. So if you're running an older computer, if you use lots of the AI tools, it may slow down a little bit, okay? But doesn't mean the program is not working properly. Okay, we can also slim the face, which I don't think they need either. I'm just gonna wait for it to catch up. Okay, yeah, I can see it sort of doing its thing there. Okay, so you can see me adding the darkness. There you can see their face being slammed, okay? I'm not crazy about that on them either. The biggest one I want to do is probably the eyes, okay? Now I'm zooming in just by clicking on the image and that goes from fit to screen up to 100% just by clicking on the screen. So I'm gonna use the eye tools here to whiten the eyes a little bit. I'm gonna increase the enhancer quite a lot. So the enhancer is kind of like adding more sparkle into the iris, okay? Lens flare or iris flare is going to add like, imagine there's a reflector under the bottom. You can kind of see it right here, let me turn my cursor on again, right in the bottom of her iris, you can see where it's working there, okay? So I don't wanna to go too far. Red eye removal, pretty self-explanatory. Dark eye, dark circle remover, pretty self-explanatory. Okay? Approve eyebrows will actually darken their eyebrows. And in this case, I'm actually gonna enlarge their eyes a little bit, okay? Now, if you go overboard with this tool, uh, you can start to make what looks like anime or cartoon characters. But in a case like this where, you know, maybe it was a bright day, which we can tell by the sun in the background, they're a little bit squinty, okay? Or if somebody has like a lazy eye or something like that, okay? 
um, you can see that it's actually going to help. See the eyes? Look at what's different is happening on their skin, right? Before, after. See how it's opening those eyes up? Okay, so I want to make sure I don't go too far. I'm going to say settle about 40, okay? Um, another little trick you can do with color of eyes is they've got it set to original. Now, they have different colored eyes. So if I choose blue, um, I'm guessing her eyes are blue, right, Holly? Um, so if I choose blue, it's going to give both of them blue eyes. Okay, so that's not correct for him, right? So I could do that and then just um, erase it from him. Or I could try gray, and I find that gray actually tends to look good on a lot of people. It's almost neutral. So you see, that one actually looks not too bad, right? Um, I'm going to make a decision to scale the skin smoothing back a little bit more. I can whiten her teeth, but I don't think she needs that. We can darken the lips. Now keep in mind that it's going to darken both of their lips, right? And the same with redness, okay? So he's not gonna want lipstick, right? So if I want to darken the lips and not change the eyes, we can mask it off of him. Right, so let me just get the skin smoothing, dial that back a tiny little bit. Okay, so now you can see the before and after, and this has taken me you know, a few minutes to do, but I'm talking about it as I'm doing it, right? All right, so now I'm going to go into the Portrait Bokeh tool, which is the brand new one, okay? So when you first open it, you'll see that nothing is, it's all sort of grayed out, but the amount slider. So you need to apply the amount first before anything happens. So I'm going to take it up to about 33 and then just wait because what's happening is under the hood, it's analyzing the image and making a cutout of them, okay? So you don't have to do any masking. It does all of that for you. Watch this, okay? See where the red is? That's the mask, okay? Now look at what a great job it did. Now the only thing it did was it missed her hair a little bit on that side, but you have the full ability to adjust the mask. The other thing you can do is, once you've gotten the mask how you want it, okay, um, you can adjust the background, okay? So I can darken the background further, so those trees in the background. I'm gonna take it to an extreme. Okay, I can actually warm up the background and make the trees more yellow okay, if I want to. I could pop the highlights a little bit. So when you're creating bokeh, you want those beautiful sort of creamy highlights, right? And we could also go the other direction, make it cooler, right? So now the trees are going to look really blue. But when you have bright colors in the background, and I've talked about this before, um, for those of you that have watched before, Bonus points if you remember the four things in the background that will grab your attention. Okay, so there will be a quiz later. <laughs> I'm going to put it on the screen in a moment. So please enter into the comments what four things, what four elements of a picture will grab your attention. Okay, so you want to avoid that in the background. I've already just talked about two of them. Okay, so as a as a hint. Okay, so I'm not crazy about it being so blue, but I like it being really dark. And I'm actually going to adjust the depth correction, okay? So depth correction is how far is this blur coming to them, okay? So defaults to zero. If I go to the left, it brings the blur closer to them, okay? So it brings it up right to them. Uh, I tried it on an image where you can see their feet and the ground, um, and it actually made them look floating, Okay, so you can see they're still cut out, but now that I've increased the depth correction, I'm going to take the amount all the way to 100, and let's see what this can really do, okay? So it should really throw this background out of focus um, and separate and cut them out. So look at how beautiful that is, right? I'm going to go not quite so far on the depth, and maybe about 90 on the amount. And I see that there's a question. What am I using to flip um, between the before and after? CJ Jr. asks. That is the, what am I using? The backslash key. So the one that angles angles to right above your return key. Okay, right? so to do before and after in Luminar, you can hold down the backslash key, which is what I'm doing, or you can hit this little eyeball up here and hold it. 
or you can hit this little before and after, but I can't do that when I'm in the tool, right? You have to close the tool, then you can use the before and after, and you get the little slider, right? I personally like doing the keyboard shortcut because I don't have to get out of the tool and I don't have to let my hands leave the keyboard. Right? Great question, CJ. Okay, so Holly has said, distractions, light, color, and contrast. You've got mm, three out of four, Holly. Very good job. So I'm going to give you the answer unless anybody else has another guess. Um, here we go. There are the four things. Okay. So brightness, sharpness, color, and contrast. So the only thing you missed was, um, let me see. What did you say again? Sharpness. Okay. So that's why this blurring of the background is so cool, right? So now let's look at this before and after. Okay. So before we had a really bright, contrasty, blown out, brightly colored background, right? Now we've toned down not only the highlights using the highlight slider, but we've toned down the overall background and the blurriness of it. And it's actually now like almost a really professional looking portrait, right? They've actually got really beautiful light on them, Holly. So your assignment is to try and replicate this now because I know you have this, right? Um, so I'm pretty happy with that. The only thing that I might do is clean up this little bit of her hair. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and show you how to, oops, no, that's not what I want to do. Um, show you how to edit the mask. Okay, so once I zoom in, it's just going to take a moment to redraw the image and redraw the mask. But I can see that there's a bit of her hair over here that got blurred. Okay, um, I explain all of these tools in that video that Rob shared earlier in, in great detail. Okay, so you can see that, yeah, her hair got missed. So under brush control, you have the option of adding focus to places that got unfocused or defocusing bits that got missed in the background, okay? So I'm just gonna go focus, and I'm gonna do it at um, not full 100%, because I want the hair to show up, but I don't necessarily want it to be fully sharp, okay? Because it was a distraction, but right now it just looks like kind of a blob, right? My other option is I could actually go into the erase tool and just get rid of it completely, okay? So let me get off the mask. Okay, so now you can see that the hair is there and it looks more realistic in terms of actually the mask, okay? Uh, looks like there's a little bit of funkiness going on in between them here as well. And I'll talk about this edge correction one too, okay? So you can see that when it's picking the mask and it's, it's done a really good job of cutting out in between them overall, but you can see there's kind of a little bit of a halo, okay, where it transitions. I'm just waiting for it to catch up on me on the mask here. Okay, so you can see there's kind of in here, there's like this glow around the edge. And I can also see that there was a spot in here. Let me turn this off again. Sometimes I want my green cursor and sometimes I don't. Okay, so I'm just gonna defocus that bit. And then my trick for getting rid of these sort of halos is to go with about 50% on the focus end and have a soft brush, okay? And now I'm adjusting these things. You'll see the sliders over here for the radius and the softness adjusting. I'm using the keyboard shortcut square brackets to make it smaller, that's left or right, and shift square brackets to make the, the um, softness change, okay? So I'm gonna go uh, brush about this size, so just slightly bigger than sort of this area in the middle. And I'm just gonna literally paint around the edge. Um, and I have the inner circle at the edge of her dress, okay? So as I'm painting, I'm trying to keep the inner circle or the part that's 100% inside their clothes. And I'm just adding sort of that fade to the outside, if that makes sense, okay? So I'm just trying to soften this, this funny edge halo that is occurring. Okay, now let's give that a minute and see if that takes effect. I can also use this slider down here called edge correction and shift it either closer to them or further away from them, right? If I want it a little tighter, I can go further and it will go closer into the people. So that might help as well. But you can see that my little brush stroke has already done pretty well on getting rid of that halo. So those are the things that you want to look for when you're doing the portrait bokeh in terms of, of things that could trip you up. Okay. Um, I had a fun interchange with a <laughs> one of my subscribers. Um, and if he's listening, the 
um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of who I was chatting with, uh, but we had a great interchange after I did my video about how um, he felt that the Boca AI looked too fake. So I sent him two different images, one that had blur in the camera already done based on a shot with a large aperture and one that I had blurred in Luminar. And I said, can you tell which is which? And he could not. <laughs> so Luminar passed that test. All right, so let's zoom out and take another look at the before and after. And I'm gonna do one more adjustment and that's on the super contrast, okay? So before and after, you can still see a little bit of that halo and I would probably just go in and do another one of those brush strokes and maybe up here to soften that edge and get rid of that problem. But under here, I'm gonna go into super contrast. This is another little trick that I use a lot because you can adjust the highlights, midtones, and shadows separately, okay? Um, if you're doing something like this in Photoshop or Lightroom, you're gonna start mucking around with the curves, okay? Or a curves adjustment. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring the highlights up quite high, and then you can see by balance, if I go to the right, it darkens the highlights. In case you look at their faces, right? They look a little orange. Left is making the highlights brighter. What I'm after here is I want to darken this little spot and these bright highlights on the background. So I'm definitely gonna go to the left and not quite so far, okay? And then I'm just gonna mask it in, okay? So I'm just gonna paint it into these areas that I want it to apply, okay? And again, when you paint, the mask shows up. And I might even do so in here, which might help us with some of that blending, right? So, you know, even though it's touching his arm, it's not going to be affecting him because I'm only affecting the highlights, okay? Right? Oops, come back here. I'll go to more extreme so you can see what it's doing. And then I can always adjust it and make it darker, okay? And I'm looking in this area here and this highlight behind him to see if it's doing anything. Wait for it to catch up. It's doing a subtle job of darkening that, okay? So that's my finished image on that one, okay? And if you wanted to do a little more work on his skin, um, you could go in and do a little bit more race. If you find that their skin tones need more adjusting, you can go into HSO and under the color tool. And let's say, for example, I want to brighten her a little bit. Orange is what you'll find in most skin tones. Okay, so you can see how luminance is going to brighten her a little bit. Okay. And if you want to lower the saturation, because maybe they're looking a little overly orange, a little, little spray tanned, which we don't want, right? And you can even adjust the color. So if they're looking too sun tanned or sunburnt, you can adjust reds. I'll go to extreme here. Now they look like they've had a bad dinner and they're about to toss their cookies, right? See how it's shifting the color? And it's only shifting reds. But if somebody has a sunburn, that's actually going to do a really nice job of correcting the sunburn, right? And you can also paint this tool in where you want it to apply. So there's a really nice before and after, right? Any questions about that? Because I'm going to apply the same thing on the next one, and we're going to do it really quickly. Is everybody ready to see it quickly? Good morning, Linton. <laughs> How are you? We have a few from down under. Uh, Ron and Linton are both from uh, Adelaide. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm going to copy the adjustments from this one, okay? And I just did that by right-clicking and choosing Adjustments, Copy, or as you can see with the keyboard shortcut, Command-C. So it's just like if you're using Microsoft Word or any other program. And then I'm gonna use Command or Control-V to paste it onto this one, okay? Now keep in mind that some things are not gonna look good, okay? Because it's gonna paste everything that I did, including the stuff where I masked in the details and stuff, okay? So what's gonna happen is it's gonna get me close, okay? Even though it's a very different image, it's gonna get me close because of a lot of the AI working. And that's the advantage of the AI stuff, right? Because it analyzes the image, okay? So now <laughs> you can see what's happened, okay? So it actually looks pretty good. The blur is a little bit over the top 
and you can see the tree is gone weird with the sharpening and that is because of this mask on this details guy okay so to fix that all i need to do is clear it and i'll just paint in a new mask okay so i can still sharpen them right if i want to sharpen them and then just remove it from the skin with the masking slider okay didn't get his hair okay but the key i don't want to get is i don't want to get it in between let me zoom in a little bit i don't want it between them because the tree is going to look too sharp in here okay which was what was happening let me it's catching up my computer is getting warm and so am i it's very warm in here again today hopefully i don't have a meltdown okay my computer is having a meltdown any questions <laughs> well he says uh that's how you make somebody look queasy so yes if you want you if you want to make them look like they're tossing their cookies that's how you do it <laughs> okay uh, I think my mouse is now, my computer is caught up. Okay, here we go. So I'm just going to take the details bit off of here. Like that. Okay. That's pretty close. Okay, so you can see I've gone too far with the details as well, because I don't think this one needed to have um, the kind of sharpening that the other one had. So I'm actually gonna dial that way down and then we should see something a little bit nicer. There we go. Okay. You can also use the denoise tool in here and it does a really nice job of, of getting rid of noise. But the biggest thing I want to show you in terms of adjustment here is also the fact that it's done the job of his skin, right? automatically right now normally when you have a subject like this that has lots of blemishes and so on you have to go and do the cloning um, or healing on every single image so i'm hoping that once we get this loaded um where is it you'll see that it's done a really good job of the removal of the shine and the skin defects or his blemishes right So it didn't get all of them, but you can see what it's doing to that background, and we're going to fix that. It's also missed part of the background up in his hair, okay? So like I said, it does a pretty good job. I'm going to zoom out to fit to screen, and let's see that mask. It did a pretty good job of masking, and now keep in mind that it's, it's done the same mask that I did before and I painted something on her hair, remember? So it did an automatic cutout of different subjects automatically. So I'm just gonna do defocus on this little bit over here and I'm gonna do a quick defocus just up on top of his head here. Again, I would come in a lot closer and zoom in but I don't wanna keep zooming in and out. And the other thing I'm gonna correct here now is this depth correction, right? Because the, the background is right behind them in this shot, you would never get this tree that out of focus, okay? It's just physically not possible with lens optics. So I'm gonna go depth correction this time to the plus side, okay? So it's going to give me a little bit of blur, and then I'm gonna bring the amount down to, let's say about 35. Okay, so let's see what that does. And let's get rid of this color. Okay, and once that comes into play, that looks a bit more realistic now. Okay, so you can see what it's doing. It is, uh, it is doing a nice job on this tree and it's darkening and blurring it a little bit without going too crazy. Okay, so you can certainly use this um, on images like this where they're not too far from the background. Just remember to play with the depth correction, okay? Because I'll show you what happens. <laughs> if we go too far, um, if we do depth correction minus 100 and amount 100, um, they're probably gonna end up floating, which is what happened to me on a previous image. Yeah, pretty close. Okay, so you see that the blur actually starts to come like it's in front of them, right? Which is certainly not realistic. So the further you go to the right on the depth slider, it's like the blur starts further away from the camera, okay? So keep it a little bit more realistic like that. But how quickly did I go from, from 
that to this with a copy and paste and a couple of uh, mask adjustments, and that's it, right? So you should be able to do this whole session now, right? <laughs> I'm gonna do the copy and paste again because I've got an image from uh, another student. This is from Krishna and she is, um, she's in Portugal now, I believe. Um, but she sent me this image and I'm going to do a crop of it first because I wanna get rid of this um, stuff in the background. Oops, not that composition, there we go. So I wanna straighten it a little bit and I'm gonna go free form because I wanna crop this car out, okay? So I wanna get more of her and less of this car in the background, right? Then I'm gonna do paste. So I just did Command and Control V and it's gonna paste those exact same settings again, completely different image, completely different setting, completely different everything, right? I can also save this as a template, okay? So if I decide I want to use this um, another time, you can, okay, I don't want color adjustments, okay, because that was adjusting the background. And I do want to do the details adjustment. I'm just going to reset it, though, um, because on this one, um, she's a little bit out of focus as well. So I'm just going to reset the vignette here, okay, just because her head is, is being too dark, so I don't want to darken her like so. All right, so I'm resetting the vignette. Now there's some sort of weird blurring on her and I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna guess that's the portrait bokeh, yeah. So she needs to be in focus, okay? So see how it didn't quite mask her. And now we have a weird mask over here. So it didn't quite get her purse, but we'll get the purse, right? Again, it pasted the last mask. And it's also missed her a little bit here where the tire is. Okay, so I want to blur the part the tire. Right. I'm just gonna do defocus. There we go. Okay, so that's getting better. And now I'm just gonna go back and do this details. Okay, so again, small details, same as we did before and I'm just going to paint it on her, okay? Because you can see that she was quite out of focus and almost the background was more in focus, and now we're doing some work to reverse that, right? So I'm just gonna sharpen her up a little bit. Again, I'm doing a really, really quick paint, really quick and dirty. I would do a much better job of painting more accurately um, in an image where I would probably spend, you know, 20 or 30 minutes on one image doing, doing these kinds of things. Okay. But I don't want to do that much detail today just to, in the essence of being able to get to more images. Okay. Now we're going to go back to that bokeh and I'm going to adjust the depth correction a little more towards her. I'm going to try the default first on both. So anytime you double click a slider, it will just pop back to the default. Okay. Um, so you can see that I've, I've darkened the background and I'm going to like turn down the color. So I'm changing it to more blue, right? Maybe not quite that much because again, colors, warm colors like orange, yellow, and red uh, project or come out or more towards the camera and cool colors like greens, blues, and purples recede or kind of disappear. So I want that background to disappear a bit more, right? Let's take a look at the before, right? So it's really a snapshot, right? And now we've done a lot of work really quickly, again, with a copy and paste, and I could save this as a template. One thing I would suggest is if you are saving your own templates, okay, you just click the little three dots down here and click save. If you are saving anything as templates, don't mask it. Okay, so for example, using the portrait bokeh, just let it do the automated one. Um, same thing with details, apply it everywhere and let the template um, have the automated version or the non-masked version. And then when you go to apply to other images, you just need to go and know and you need to go and do the mask instead of adjusting it. Okay, because if you forget, right, like the one that I copied on to Holly's second image, um, I got some weird stuff happening in the tree. All right. 
So any questions? Uh, I do not have English subtitles. Um, I believe, are we putting English subtitles on the um, video later on YouTube, Rob? I know we do subtitles on some of our videos. Um, is your name uh, Kai Vu or, or Vu Kai? I, are you in um, Vietnam? Um, I know that there's a feature of YouTube where we can add the subtitles, but not while I'm live, unfortunately. That's not something we can do live. So you could try watching it later. We do have to get that put on. Um, but if you could please let him know, Rob, if uh, English subtitles is an, is an option. All right, so let's switch it up and do something a little bit different. Uh, this is an image that was submitted by uh, one of my students, Mike Oshima. And he submitted this a while ago, and I was assuming because he wanted to know how to get rid of this, this giant hand at the top here, okay? So it looks like he was maybe blocking the sun or something like that, and he got his hand in the picture, right? So I'm going to show you that. So we're not doing portrait bokeh this time. We're going to use the erase tool again. Um, and the erase tool works surprisingly well inside of Luminar. So all you need to do is paint over the area you want to erase. In this case, I want to get a little bit around as well, okay? And then just hit erase. And it does a really good job of analyzing or doing what's called content aware fill, okay? And filling it in. So just for the answer on that, for um, the last person that asked, we do subtitles um, for, don't do it for streams, but we do for tutorials. Um, he's going to consider doing that. Vietnam, Vietnamese isn't one. I think he just wanted English subtitles, Rob, so that he could slow it down and, and read them as well, because I'm talking too fast. I hope that's what he meant. And actually, by the way, if if that's the case for any of you, because I do tend to talk fast, um, if you watch this later on the replay or on YouTube, you can actually change the speed and slow me down, right? Sometimes I watch videos or listen to podcasts at, you know, 1.25 or 1.5 speed. But if you want to listen to me to points and five, that's fine too. Question from Terrence. Will putting the photos on a flash drive and working from that location help the com with computer limitations? Um, I'm assuming you mean like something like like this, Terrence, where you have like an SSD drive. Okay, so an SSD drive is different than in a flash drive. Um, like a flash drive is like a USB stick that you don't want to use. Um, the the flash drive, if your images are all so right now, all my images are on on an external drive. It's not an SSD. So if you do have an SSD drive for your images, that will help. Yes. The program itself runs on the computer though. Um, and my computer does have an SSD drive, but it's more limited to um, other types of resources. It's not just um, it's not just that, right? So the speed of the drive um, does help, right? Okay, so now that I've gotten rid of the big giant hand, I'm gonna go into templates. So that's something we haven't talked about yet. And this is another one of the things that's beautiful about Luminar because they changed this when they went from Luminar 4 to Luminar AI. They used to be called looks, and now they're called templates. And they're kind of like presets or some settings that are applied to your picture based on one click, okay? And what Luminar AI does now is it actually suggests some for you. So at the very top here, you'll see where it says, for this photo. And the first one it's suggesting is one called Scenery Collection. Right, so I'm gonna just click on a couple of them and see what they do, right? Well, that's kind of nice. That's kind of nice. And literally, you're just sort of seeing what they do. <laughs> okay, that one has a sky replacement, so probably not. Some of them do have sky replacements. There's another collection called Easy Landscapes. Okay, so depending on if you want this to be cool, there's a black and white. You can literally just scroll through and see different looks for your images, okay? Another one called sunsets. There's usually a black and white, okay? That's a very different look, okay? It's very orange. Um, if you live in Alberta or BC right now, you probably know that our sky looks like this often because we're dealing with a lot of forest fires. 
But the thing you can do with these templates is you can actually dial the effect down, right? So this slider at the bottom here, I'm waiting for it to catch up again. This slider here at the bottom, if you dial it down, the effect is like it's lowering the opacity. Okay, so if I say, oh, I really like that effect, but it's too strong, just dial it down, right? Now that I'm looking at it at about 50%, of course, the hand comes back when I do before and after, right? But it, now it's given it a very sort of warm feeling. So you get to decide, you know, how do you want this image to look? This is bringing out more in the water, right? Like, look at, I can actually see into this pond or swamp, right? So if you want to stick with um, the cooler version, uh, I kind of liked one in this set. And I like, I like the fact that it's a little bit cool and foggy. Uh, I think it was in the first one. Or I can scroll through my favorites as well. I think it was, no, not that one. It was definitely not that one. <laughs> no, definitely not that one. You can also, um, just because it, my templates, for example, that I created for the marketplace are called portrait, doesn't mean you have to use them only on portraits, right? I have one that's called antique touch, for example, that turns it into more of like a faded black and white sepia look, right? With some added grain. And if you look at that, I think that actually looks kind of cool, right? We can even dial it down a little bit. Or if you don't like certain aspects of it, like if you don't like the graininess of it, you can just go and take that filter off, right? So I kind of like that version, right? I'm going to leave it on and edit from there. So I don't like the film grain on this one because it takes away from the fog. So we'll just remove that. But I think everything else I quite like. Um, it's not a full black and white conversion. I believe I did this one, um, yeah, with a sepia tone or a lot under the mood filter. Okay, so I could just dial that one down a little bit as well and shift that over. Okay, so you have full ability to adjust it even after you've used a template. And now you can see that it says antique touch edited and I could save that one as a new one and call it Antique Touch 2 or something like that, right? So that's a really kind of a cool image. Um, <laughs> Atmosphere AI adds more fog, so we could add even more fog if you want in this one. It's a very moody image, so I like the fact that it has the fog and I don't really wanna get rid of it. Um, like I said, if anything, I want to enhance it, right? I find that AI enhance will probably try and get rid of that fog, right? So if I pull that up, you're starting to see the things come out of the fog and landscape, the landscape tool has a dehaze slider, which will do the same thing, right? So it's trying to get rid of the amount of fog, right? Let me turn the atmosphere off. So if you want to get rid of fog, go to the enhance AI or to dehaze under landscape. Right? and you'll get a bit more of that. If you wanna take it even farther, you can just simply go to light and actually drag the black slider down, right? Because the more blacks you have in the image, the less sort of foggy it will look, right? Now we've got this sort of really crisp part in the, in the foreground, the middle part is a little bit sharp and now the foggy background is, is fading out. And it's, to me, it's really pleasing. I might go and choose a different mood on this one, maybe something bluer. So that's that um, LUT. I'm going to look for something with greens and blues. But you know what? I might find something that's completely different. Um, just hovering over, the mouse shows me a preview. But I might find something that I don't expect that's completely a different color. So far, they're all fairly similar. Let me go down to the bottom here. Okay, that one's a little different. I'm gonna choose Gloria and then just turn it up a little. So you can see that one has a very different color, right? If you're not sure what color, just crank it again and go back and do your mouse over. Ooh, that one's kind of different, isn't it? Kind of like that one. So happy accident, right? So let's do a quick before. We'll get our giant hand back again and after. 
Okay, so really quickly, all I've really done here is a hand removal with the erase tool and applied a template and then played around with it a little bit. And it's a really, really pretty image to begin with, all right? So one thing I want to kind of stress with photo editing is that you want to use photo editing as an enhancement for your images, not generally as a fix. Okay, sometimes we can fix things like the sharpness that we talked about in the images earlier, um, cropping problems, things like that, um, removal of a piece of garbage, those are kind of givens and okay. But if you get into really having to fix your images, think about slowing down when you're photographing and just taking more time to make sure that you take care of some of those problems in camera when you're shooting, right? So just keep track of your images. I think I might send that one to Mike. I think he's gonna like it. All right. Um, let's see. This is what I wanted to play with because um, I wanted to do see about templates on this one. And I'm gonna start with a crop as well on this one. Uh, so I'm going to start with this one and let's just try auto tilt. So it was crooked a little bit and I'm going to click composition. So when you click the composition AI button, this purple one here, I find that often I really agree with the actual crop, but not necessarily the placement of it. Okay. I like the fact that it's now straight. And the reason that I agree with this crop is because I find that the original image, this, this bridge is right smack in the middle. And let me just undo this for a moment here. The bridge is right smack in the middle and both ways, okay? So it's in the center third, if you're looking at the rule of thirds. So that's something you want to avoid generally. And I find that there's kind of nothing really over on this right-hand panel to keep my attention. The clouds aren't as interesting as this fluffy one over here. So for me, the interest is in the two thirds of this image over here and not so much the top and the right hand side. Okay, so I'm gonna straighten it, composition and crop like so, right? Okay, already looking better. This one I am gonna try the enhance or the accent AI. Okay, so look what it's doing, take it all the way. It's doing a great job of increasing the contrast, the color. It's also bringing up the shadows. And then because the sky enhancer slider is active, meaning it recognizes there's a sky in this picture, you can drag that up and it's kind of like having a polarizing filter on your lens, okay? So see how it's darkening the blue? You wanna be careful with this one that you don't take it too far, All right? Let's just go a little farther. If I did want to go that far, what I would probably do is go down into the color panel over here and lower the saturation of the blues and the cyans. Okay, so it looks like it's more blue. Yeah, okay. If you're not sure what color, just drag the slider all the way and you'll find out. So I'm just going to lower the saturation of that blue a little bit because it's gone a bit too far. Okay, so I like what it's doing in terms of enhancements, but the, the color was too much. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna add a vignette and I'm just gonna go straight from the middle. Should be all right. Okay, so you can start to see it. That's what you don't want to do. You don't want to make vignettes that look like that. Okay, so make sure that your feather is high and your amount is more subtle. Right, so before and after, it's already more interesting. And now what I was thinking was I'd like to have some side sort of a um, color toning or mood on this one, but I'm gonna play a little bit with the dramatic filter also. So dramatic tends to push um, what they call local contrast, and it also lowers the saturation. I can put it back a little bit. And you get sort of almost this grungy, slightly desaturated look, okay? I find that I like to raise the amount slider and lower the local contrast. So local contrast makes it more grungy, right? So if I lower that but keep the amount higher, it's not as over the top. I mean, that's more of my taste, right? So you have to figure out if, if that's how you prefer it. Right? Let's go back to mood. Again, this is one of my favorite things to add and I add it to a lot of my images. 
you'll find that once you start using these, um, you'll find a few that are really fitting for your style and the things that you like to shoot, whether that's um, street photography and so on. So I had a couple of ideas for this image. Um, the first one, actually, this Anaheim one, uh, it kind of reminds me of like a 70s photo. It looks a little bit industrial, maybe dirty, you know, like old time London or something like that. So I'm just kind of scrolling through these to find something that fits with my initial thought of that image, okay? But in doing so, if I see something else that looks good, I might go with it. So I'm still kind of just keeping in my mind, okay, the first one was still the best. I don't see anything else that's grabbing me. And you'll notice that I turned the amount slider up to 50 just so that I can see the effect more. I can always dial it down later, but it helps me to choose when I can see it a little bit stronger. Uh, let's see, still I'm liking the first one. Okay, Memphis is kind of cool. Miami's kind of cool. Tokyo, I still like that first one. All right, let's go back to Anaheim because I still like that one. So I'm actually gonna crank it up. I'm gonna give it a bit more contrast, okay? And then you can actually play with the saturation. Okay, saturation is gonna take it all the way to zero. I kinda like that, okay? I don't want it to be quite as yellow, like that. So that to me gives it a much more industrial kind of feeling, right? You can add a matte filter. So matte filter, what that does is it makes it sort of look like your blacks are faded out, right? So the higher you go, the less detail there are in the blacks and almost like more of an old photo. So if you're doing um, a black and white sepia or something that you want to look more antique, play with the matte filter as well. All right. I remember I played with the super contrast earlier on the highlights. I can do that again. Let's darken them. So I really want to bring some, see that cloud? So I really want to bring the detail out in this cloud here, but I don't want to affect these so much. So once again, I'm just going to paint in. I'm just going to paint it into this area. So as soon as I paint it there, it disappears everywhere else, okay? Now I do find that the image has gone a little bit grainy. So I might just go with that and add some foam grain. That's a little bit much. So again, I'm bringing it up high and then dial it back. So now for me, it really looks like something that might've been taken in the seventies, right? For those of us that remember the seventies. <laughs> and just to answer your question from before, um, the YouTube will auto-generate subtitles. Okay, so it'll take a little while. Perfect, so we learned something new. Thanks for asking that question. Um, so if you watch it again later, you should be able to replay with subtitles. There you go. All right, let's see what else we've got. I've only got a couple more images that I want to work on today. Um, keep it simple. Please a reminder that we do need to get more images submitted because I am actually running out. So use the description um, or Rob, if you could even put a link to the form in the comment section now, um, please use the form to submit your images and uh, a couple of images for, for submission. Please, if you wanna submit more than two, just fill the form in again, okay? Um, if I don't get to your images all at the same time, some of these I've had for weeks and I'm just getting to them now. So I try and do different people's images every week. So I'm not doing too many of the same persons and also different kinds of images so that you can see different techniques, right? So feel free to submit many images at once, not just two, and I'll keep Apparently I disappeared. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I hope everybody is still there. Apparently I hit back on my screen. And uh, can you still hear me? If you can all still hear me, please say so. Rob, tell me if you can still hear me. Uh, we had a little boo-boo there. Uh, that was interesting. 
Apparently I hit back on my mouse and it automatically took me out of the, the broadcast. So hopefully you can all still see me. Okay, Ray has a question. Let me get this off the screen. Is there a way to import an image directly into Luminar, create some effects, save the file, and reopen it back into Luminar at a later date and still have the history? Um, you kind of don't have to do that, Ray, because yes, you can open it. So all of these images are in Luminar Direct, okay? Now, I haven't, I haven't um, exported any of these, but let's say, for example, I'm done with this one and I want to export it, okay? So I can export this image, right? Um, to my, you know, save it to my disk, my hard drive or whatever, okay? But what will happen is, I'm just gonna save it to my downloads for a moment here, just as an example. What will happen is if I re-import it, it'll be a new file with no history, okay? So this one will keep the history, but the new one will have no history because it's a brand new image, okay? Um, and you can export to whatever format, you know, you want based on the um, export. But if you want to, I'm just gonna cancel this. If you want to go back to the history at any time, it's all still there, okay? So anything I did to this picture, let me get your comment off the screen here, okay? You can see that all the history that I did to this picture is still there, okay? Um, the same with any of these that I've just worked on. And in fact, um, this is an image, these are images that I worked on months ago, right, when Luminar AI first came out, and do I still have a history on this one? Let's hope so. Yeah, so you can still see my history is there, and I can go back to any of the history states um, on this image, right? So I hope that answers your question. Uh, where did we go? All right, get back here. So where was I before I ejected myself? <laughs> well, that's a new one. I've never ejected myself from the from the broadcast before, but good to know that it did not um, end on me automatically. So maybe I've got a buffer before it uh, before it kicks me out. Okay, so this one, let's see. I want to actually go to templates here. Uh, let me see, now is this one a raw file? Yes, okay, so this is a raw file. Uh, I think this is from your group, Linton. Um, this is Phil's image, I think. So I'm just going to go and click some of these here and see if they do a nice job. And again, go from there. So the idea you know, behind the templates is they're a quick jumping off point so look at that, that actually does a really nice job. It's picking up the detail, sharpening it, increasing the contrast, doing a really good job. So I think I'm just gonna go with that. Uh, let's try the clear sky one, because there is a clear sky here. Right? Sometimes the danger of when you're enhancing a sky like this that doesn't have um, a lot of detail is you can end up getting what's called banding, okay? That one does a nice job as well. Okay, so it looks like both of these are doing a pretty good job. So I'm just going to go with this one and edit from here. And I might actually do a sky replacement. Okay? Um, you can see what it's done. If you want to find out what the template is doing, just look at all the tools that have a little dot next to them. Those are the ones that have been applied. Okay? Now I'm actually going to go into structure and mask it, okay? The reason we're not mask it is because it's increasing the structure, which is increasing the sharpness, but we don't necessarily want that on this background or on the sky, okay? So I'm going to apply a gradient mask, okay? So previously, I've been painting the mask in, so I'm just gonna apply a gradient mask, okay? Now you'll notice that I applied it upside down, okay? So where you can see the mask, is it's now applying this filter in the sky, okay? So I don't want that. So I have two choices. I can literally just grab this and rotate it, or I can go here and go invert, okay? So now it's upside down. And I'm gonna pull it down a little bit more because I really, oops, I should have done it the other way. Let's start over again. All right, so we were at 35. Let me try that again. All right, mask. And I'm gonna do it the right way this time. So I'm gonna go from the bottom right, and drag it up 
just to the edge sort of of that horizon because I don't want to sharpen the horizon um, and add structure, which is kind of like clarity if you're used to Lightroom. And that gets rid of a lot of that sort of um, halo that was happening in the sky. Okay. I'm going to go up here. Yeah, I can see that some enhancements have been done here. If I take the sky farther, okay, it gives me a little bit more darker blue at the top. And then you start to see, do you see that stripe here? Okay, so that's what's called banding. Okay, so you can only pull information so far before you start to lose literally information in the file, even though it's raw, okay? So let's do the sky enhancement a different way. Um, the sky is really sort of plain and bland. We could crop in a little bit tighter as well because she's kind of far away. So let's see what kind of composition suggestions the program makes. So again, I'm going to just move it over and keep its suggestion, but get rid of most of this tree. And I might even go a little farther with it. Okay. Now you'll notice that if I come up or down, it's keeping the aspect ratio. Okay, so aspect ratio is like width to height at the same perspective. If I wanted to make this more panoramic, for example, I could do that as well, right? So if I just wanted less sky, right, I just have to change this to free aspect ratio, and then I can do whatever I want, right? So panorama is kind of nice as well, but I like to get rid of this. I want to get rid of this tree. All right. Now we're gonna go into sky. So there's a couple of things I could do here. We could do augmented sky and add something to the sky. So we could add some clouds, we could add a rainbow, and they've got fireworks and planets, or even the space shuttle, right? The one that I probably use the most is birds, right? So I'll often add some birds, and then once they get placed, you can resize them. Where's my birds? still thinking about it, you can resize them and move them around inside of the image, right? Oh, you recognize this woman, <laughs> cool. All right, so now I can place this, this birds, okay? So you can see where it's put them. I can make it smaller and move them over. Um, I kind of had the idea of putting the birds over on the side. Hopefully it's gonna catch up to me here, come on. Put them over here, and I'm going to refine them a little bit and mask them a little bit. I just kind of want to fade them out a bit so they look like they're far off in the distance, and that's what that relight slider does. Can you see how that sort of faded them out a little bit? So it's like they're they're a little bit hazy. I could also defocus them a couple of notches, okay. like so. So that just adds something um, of interest and it kind of balances with her. Maybe not quite so far over. I might move them over a little bit or we could do a complete sky replacement, okay? So there's clear skies. I've got a few presets and different packages. Um, please share a link to our sky, plan our sky pack, please, Rob. Uh, one thing you wanna keep in mind when selecting a sky for replacement is that it's applicable and it fits for the image, okay? So once the sky pops in there, you will be able to see, does it look right with this image? And what I'm looking at is the direction of light in the original image. So it's fairly non-directional here, right? So we wanna make sure we have a sky that doesn't have the actual sun, okay? So that's correct. Um, I'm gonna flip it, I think. And one of the things they changed in the last update, which is update four, if you haven't updated your Luminar AI, make sure you do that, um, is this horizon position is now new. So when you click horizon position, you will get a, a little adjustment tool, hopefully, <laughs> in a second here. I told you my computer is getting warm, so am I. <sighs> okay, where's my horizon placement? Come on. Come on, computer, come on. Come. So I'm looking for a little bar to show up here. Not sure why it's not showing up for me. Okay, when in doubt, hang on, I'm just gonna, oh, there it was. I didn't wait long enough. Okay, horizon position. Come on, you can do it. 
but I already kind of like what's happening here. Um, that's one of my favorite skies. I use this one. That's when I shot and I use this one a fair bit because I, I like the uh, sort of diagonal clouds and the little wispy one over there. Um, and it works well in a lot of cases like this. I can, uh, come on, give me the horizon placement. Talking to myself here. Okay, I don't need reflection because there's no water. Come on, give me the horizon placement. It showed up a moment ago. Um, while we're waiting for that to occur, is there any other questions about anything? So Rob has shared a link to the form. Okay, so you can get to that. There's a link in the chat. You could click on and get to the form to submit your images, um, or it'll be below the video in the description afterwards. All right, come on, where's my... There it is. All right, here we go. Okay, so now this is the horizon placement. So now you can adjust it easily with this tool and you can fade it or soften the edge, right? Where you used to have sliders to do these things. Now you have this little, uh, little button and the two um, adjustments. You can also rotate it if you need to adjust the horizon that way. Okay. All right, so, so far that is looking good. You'll notice that I also increased the haze amount um, because this sky wasn't sort of really punchy itself. I increased the haze on the horizon because it's gonna blend better with this actual picture. And then I'm gonna add some relight, which is going to relight the actual original image, right? and give the original image matching with the same color as the new sky, okay? So Rob has a good question. Do I notice how the Luminar logo changes color? So it's kind of like it's waving. Um, yes, that is the software thinking, exactly. All right, so now let's see the before and after, okay? So see what it's done is it's actually punched up and added some of that color that's in the sky into her as well, okay? And I can use these sliders if I need to do any masking. Um, I might actually move this sky a little bit to the left so you can move it side to side as well, like that. And I might move it up just a tiny bit. So I wanna get those birds sort of in this area here. I like what's happening. And I'm just going to go back to augmented sky and attempt to place that. All right. There's the birds. Move them down here. Um, one cool thing you will notice is that when you do one of these sky augmented items, you can also add your own. Okay? The key is that they have to be a, a transparent PNG, meaning that the birds um, the behind them are, are is clear, okay? Now you'll notice if I move the birds below this mountain here, they'll actually disappear, okay? Because it knows where the horizon is and it won't put the birds over top of there. So it's pretty, pretty smart. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna defocus them a bit more and I actually might fade them out a little bit. Maybe even make them a bit smaller. I really just wanna have like just a little something there. Right, so we've taken an image, right? That was probably something that he took while they were out walking or hiking, right? And we've punched it up. So it's punched up the overall, started with the template, replaced the sky, added a sky element, right? And then we could take it even a step further if we go into the portrait bokeh, we could then blur the background, but I'm gonna do that face light, right? So see, it should pick up her face. So see how she's kind of dark. So I'm just gonna give her just ever so slightly a little bit of light in her face. That works well. Um, and that's about all I'm gonna do. I could do portrait bulk on this one, but I don't think it's realistic to blur this background um, because of the wide angle and it was shot with a fairly small camera. But the sky replacement um, adds something of a little bit of punch to it, all right? All right, we are at an hour and a half today, and I think that's about all I'm going to cover. I've got some left for next week that I'm going to do, which is um, another landscape. So if you tune in next week, I'm going to do this one, 
and a macro, which is from Ann Ambrose. So I'm going to make sure that she's here because I did not see her today. And she's usually here. And another one from uh, Bob, who was with me in India a couple of years ago. So um, this is a fellow that I actually photographed as well. So that's happened a few times in our live events. Uh, Linton and I photographed the same fellow in Vietnam. So those are the ones I'm going to work on next week. And maybe your image could be in that bunch as well. So I want to thank everybody for joining me. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please pop them in the chat. I'll stick around for a little while in the chat and keep answering questions. And if you're watching this later, uh, you could put your questions into the comment area below the video on YouTube. So thank you for watching. Um, please remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel every week here on YouTube. It's at youtube.com forward slash digital photo mentor forward slash live every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern Time. I will be doing this again. So thank you so much for joining in. I hope that you've learned some tips using Luminar and how quickly you can edit your images using Luminar AI. Take care.